Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Exploring Quantum Physics. I'm Charles Clark, and this lecture is going to discuss the theory and applications of angular momentum. Very important concept in quantum physics, and one that in some sense defines a larger framework uh, within which we look at many problems. You might say everything revolves around angular momentum. Now, Joe, get it? But it is, in fact, a very important framework. And um, I'll just draw your attention to a random example from the additional material sections under the uh, title Atomic Clocks and Quantum Computers. Uh, this is a, a figure from a paper uh, written by David Weinland, won the Nobel Prize in Physics last year. And it's a visionary uh, paper that describes the relationship between at atomic clocks and quantum computers and actually provided a roadmap for the development of the first practical quantum computing device, as I see it, which was this um, uh, an optical clock based on the aluminum ion. Now, um, th what you see here is a schematic of two atomic energy level structures. And they're given you know, a number of these very precise labels. It's only like five halves. It's not like 2.6. It's exactly five halves. So there are these uh, various quantum numbers. And I don't expect you to necessarily recognize these right now. But these all are developed on the basis of an un understanding of the conservation of angular momentum in quantum systems and its quantization. And uh, this is extremely important. It underpins uh, everything, atomic clocks, the operation of magnets at a fundamental level, and so on. So. In this lecture, we're going to go through some of the, the fundamental uh, techniques that are required to use, uh, develop and use the theory of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. So in particular, we're going to derive a number of foundational properties of the angular momentum operators. And um, I'm going to introduce something that is pretty standard um, a uh, set of procedures for tensor calculus, they're very useful in developing a practical understanding of how you deal with angular momentum algebra. And so uh, some of you may be familiar with these. Uh, in that case, the first few parts of this lecture might be sort of a review or tutorial. Uh, this, we're using an approach that was first developed by Albert Einstein. Uh, and it seems at first like sort of just a notational innovation, but it has a lot of important practical consequences. And it's as useful in many areas of physics. Now, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to use vector notation, but all the symbols denote operators. So, in other words, the angular momentum in classical mechanics is this, is this object, and we saw its significance in the context of the classical theory, the hydrogen atom, earlier. So now we're treating it as, well, let's say, a vector valued operator. So it has three components, right? Uh, Lx is equal to xpy minus y, oh, sorry, Lz is equal to xpy minus ypz, ypx, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and then there's, a, there's an Ly and an Lx as well. Uh, so this, uh, but these are now to be interpreted in terms of the quantum mechanical operators. So I'm going to switch notation because, as it turns out, it's, it's much easier to do calculations when you don't have different, different symbols for coordinates, but you just have a different uh, subscript. So hereafter, uh, we're going to use a convention x1, x2, and x3 for the coordinates, and then for the unit vectors, e1, e2, and e3. But, you know, occasionally we may lapse and, and uh, switch back. Okay, so now um, the first thing that uh, you should take a note of, this is going to become important in the derivations, is the use of the Einstein summation convention for repeated indices. This was something that was actually discovered by Einstein, well, not discovered, first pointed out by Einstein. And he said, well, he noticed there are lots of expressions uh, of this type. Here's the scalar product of two vectors, uh, a and b, which in our, our new notation, we would write these as some of ai, 
bi. And what Einstein noted is that you can just, in cases like that, you can just cross out the summation sign. And so whenever you encounter uh, an expression of this type, you implicitly sum over a repeated index. That saves the um, s saves the presence of having large numbers of summation signs. Now you do have to be careful when you do this, but uh, that's why we're going to uh, engage in some practice. Another um, another tool that's um, the, th the thir third of these tools, really useful, is the Levitivita symbol. So this has, uh, op has a three subscripts, and it takes the values plus one, minus one, or zero according to whether, in the first instance, if the symbols i, j, k are a, a cyclic or even permutation of the symbols one, two, three. So you can see, okay, one, two, three, if you, if you shift that back uh, with a revolving um, displacement of the index, it goes to two, three, one, shift it back again, it's three, one, two, then again it returns to itself. Uh, the odd permutations are those which involve just a transposition of two elements. So uh, one, two, three, uh, if you switch one and two, you get two, one, three, and so on. So the, uh, the Levitivity symbol is minus one in cases like that. And then it's zero otherwise, meaning uh, when, uh, for example, two or more of the indices are the same. So in other words, it, it, it vanishes unless Every, every one of these, uh, every value of the index is, 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 is present. So now the uh, in-video quiz will ask you to construct the vector cross product using some of the, uh, the tools that we've just described. So that um, example just showed you how you can use the Einstein convention, Levi-Civita symbols, and the uh, index uh, system to conveniently do uh, standard procedures of vector algebra, which you, you find useful in electromagnetism and mechanics. And we'll, we'll make use of such examples in further, uh, uh, further discussion here. Uh, now finally, there's a um, very important contraction identity of this form. So. Uh, all I can say is, look at this carefully. Here's the Einstein summation convention, and you see there's a, what's, we call it a contraction identity because there's a duplication of, of two of the indices. When that happens, it turns out that you can reduce this product of the Levitivita symbols to uh, some of the products of delta functions, chronic or delta, uh, which, is, which has the following definition. I think you're all familiar with that. Delta ij is equal to 1 if i is equal to j, and uh, 0 otherwise. And um, I think it would be, um, uh, it's, it's probably a good idea for you to, to pause and just look at this and run a few examples to convince yourself that it's true. So just to put everything together with one, um, with one example, uh, let's, let's take something from classical vector calculus. A cross the quantity B cross C, uh, something that arises very often in applications. And um, we'll use, so we, here we use the uh, uh, summation convention and the Levi-Civita. Uh, 
and then you know uh, so here's here we here we have a second here we see the this pair of Levi-Civita symbols come in the full expansion and basically what we're doing here we're getting down to sort of the most fundamental reduction of this of this uh, quantity in ter in terms of its components so that's this and now we see that we can um, we can apply the uh, the uh, the contraction identity thusly and we uh, end up I think you want a good idea for you to look at this and follow it through uh, offline uh, that we get the famous back cab rule which is often used for uh, resolving vector products Okay, this is very much a methodological part of the lecture, so I um, uh, hope you'll uh, review what you've learned. And then we're going to, uh, in the next few parts of the lecture, start applying this to develop important information about angular momentum. Hope to see you again.